Hello and welcome back to Crash Course. Today we're going to be continuing to look at the GI system and the revision for that. So in the previous video we looked at the anatomy and physiology and embryology of the GI system. In the next video we're going to look at the pathway from mouth to anus and the histology. But in this video we're going to be looking at the innovation and vasculature of the GI system. So let's start with innovation. So the innovation to the GI tract is autonomic. And it has parasympathetic and sympathetic branches. So remember that the parasympathetic is all about rest and digest. And the sympathetic aspect is all about fight and flight response. Innovation to the GI tract also comes from its own nervous system. And this nervous system is called the enteric nervous system. So it's got 100,000 million neurons. And surprisingly, this is the same number of neurons as the central nervous system has. So the autonomic nervous system acts upon the enteric nervous system. And as you can imagine, with parasympathetic nervous system being all about rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system increases the activity of the enteric nervous system. It increases the activity of the gut's nervous system. On the other hand, the sympathetic nervous system functions to inhibit the activity of the GI tract by blocking the enteric nervous system. So innovation of the GI tract, the autonomic nervous system, then remember we said sympathetic is inhibitory to the GI tract. And the sympathetic branch comes from T5, so thoracic vertebra T5, to L2, lumbar 2. And it is made up of the greater splanchnic nerve, which supplies the foregut, the lesser splanchnic nerve, which supplies the midgut, and the lumbar splanchnic nerves, which supply the hindgut. On the other hand, you've got the parasympathetic nervous system, which is excitatory to the GI tract. And this cranially comes from the vagus nerve, so the foregut and midgut, and the hindgut gets its innervation from the sacral aspect, from the pelvic splanchnic nerves. So the sympathetic we can describe as being thoracolumbar, and parasympathetic we can describe as being craniosacral. And some people may find this useful to view in a table. So allowing you to understand the area that it supplies, where the supply is coming from, and what region of the cord it's from, and what ganglia and its synapses within. And likewise you can do this with a parasympathetic nervous system. So remember we said that the sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar, and then the parasympathetic is craniosacral. So the enteric nervous system is embedded within the lining of the GI tract. So in the last video we looked at the lining of the GI tract, so remember the mucosa, the submucosa, and so on, the muscular layers, and so on. So there are two plexuses to know. So there's the myenteric plexus, which is also called the Arbax plexus, and it has parasympathetic and sympathetic input. It innervates the muscular layers of the walls of the GI tract, and it's involved in control of gut motility. On the other hand, you have the submucosal plexus, also called Meissner's plexus. So this has only parasympathetic input, and it provides secretor motor innervation to the mucosa, so it provides the ability to secrete stuff. And you can look at these in a diagram. So on the diagram, we can see the mucosa here, which is the inner layer, which is made up of the epithelium, on the most inner side, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. Then you've got your submucosa, and within your submucosa, you've got the Meissner's uh, plexus, or the submucosal plexus, within the submucosa. Then you have your muscularis propria. So remember this is made up of circular and longitudinal muscle. And in between your circular muscle, here, and your longitudinal muscle here, you have the Arbarx plexus, or the myenteric plexus. And then remember, you've got that outer layer, that um, connective tissue, which is the serosa, or alternatively named the adventitia. So now let's move on to look at the vasculature of the GI system. So obviously, vasculature, we're referring to arteries and veins. So very simply looking, remember that you have the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut. So each of those has a supply from a different artery. So the foregut is supplied by the celiac artery or the celiac trunk. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut is supplied by the interior, inferior mesenteric artery. And these are all branches of the abdominal aorta. They're the three main branches of note um, before the abdominal aorta bifurcates into the common iliac arteries. So the portal venous system is something else to be aware of. So in terms of the venous drainage then of the GI system, so all the venous blood from the GI tract and accessory organs passes through the liver via the portal venous system before returning to the inferior vena cava. The portal vein is created by the joining of the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein. 
and the venous blood passes through the capillary bed of the liver, it then exits the liver via the hepatic vein, and drains into the inferior vena cava. So what's really important is to be aware that the blood from the GI tract actually goes through the liver before going back to the inferior vena cava. So now let's return to look at the arteries of the GI system. So I like to look at things in a simple diagram, and I've done this for all three of the arteries to allow you to kind of understand what branches into what, but be aware that you need to know them on a diagram as well as just a systematic drawing. So remember with the GI tract we start with this abdominal aorta, and from the abdominal aorta you can look that it branches into three as we've said, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. Now the celiac trunk arises at the L1, but the upper part of L1, the superior mesenteric arises at the lower part of L1, and then the inferior mesenteric arises a little bit lower at L3. So first of all let's look at the celiac trunk. So the celiac trunk can be branched into the splenic artery, the left gastric artery, and the common hepatic artery. So the left gastric artery goes on to anastomose with the right gastric artery, which we'll learn about in a moment. And along the way you have oesophageal branches. The splenic artery goes all the way to the spleen, and then has five branches to the spleen. On the way, it divides into the left gastroepiploic artery, the short gastric artery, and the pancreatic branches. Then we can have a look at the common hepatic artery, which branches into this proper hepatic artery, and the gastroduodenal artery. The branches of the gastroduodenal artery are quite extensive, so you have the superior pancreatic or duodenal artery, and the right gastroepiploic artery and the superior pancreatic duodenal can branch into an anterior and a posterior branch. The proper hepatic artery can branch into three, so the right gastric artery, the cystic artery, and the right and left hepatic artery. So I can appreciate that there are a lot of branches for the celiac trunk, but understanding primarily that the celiac trunk branches into the left gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic, and then from then on, understanding the major branches, it gives you an idea as to where each artery is going. So as we've already said, the celiac trunk arises at L1. Branch 2 is the superior mesenteric artery, which you'll be glad to hear is a little bit simpler. So the superior mesenteric artery divides into four. Your jejunal arteries, which surprise surprise go to the jejunum. Your ileal arteries go to the ileum. And then you have colic arteries and iliocolic arteries. So the colic artery can be further subdivided into a middle and a right colic artery. And the iliocolic artery can be divided into the appendicular artery and the anterior cecal artery and the posterior cecal artery, and this arises L1. So as I said, a little bit simpler. So now to look at the inferior mesenteric artery. So this supplies the hindgut and arises at L3. So the inferior mesenteric artery can be divided into a superior rectal artery, a sigmoid artery, and a left colic artery. The sigmoid artery goes on to have two to four branches, including a superior sigmoid artery. The superior rectal artery goes on to form the middle rectal artery and the inferior rectal artery. And the left colic artery can be divided into an ascending branch and a descending branch. The descending branch of the left colic artery anastomoses with the superior sigmoid artery, which is a branch of the sigmoid artery from the inferior mesenteric. And this arises at L3, as we said. And this one here, the middle rectal artery specifically, arises at S3. So this is the diagrammatic representation of the vascular trabant. So as you can see here, um, this is a branch of the celiac artery. So what I'd recommend you do is you take this picture and you look at it side by side with the branches of the celiac artery and put them together so understand that this is a hepatic artery. So therefore if you know this is a hepatic artery, you need to know it divides into the gastroduodenal and the proper hepatic artery and so on. So on being able to put them together and being able to label them on a diagram. So that's the celiac. This is a superior mesenteric artery, which is already nicely labelled, and this can be split up into colours, so you've got the jejunal and ileal arteries down here, the iliocolic, the right colic, and the middle colic artery. Then the inferior mesenteric, which is quite extensively labelled um, down here, um, but also this kind of gives you a nice overall take-back picture um, of the vasculature as it runs down the abdominal aorta, and you can see the branches of the celiac and the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric, and where they actually go. And then lastly, this is zoomed in on the inferior mesenteric artery, okay, and showing off these branches to the remainder of the descending colon and the rectum. So veins of the GI system, not as complicated, okay, and this diagram here pretty much summarises all you need to know about the veins. So the inferior mesenteric vein drains into the splenic vein, okay, so you can see this here, 
the inferior mes mesenteric vein, which drains the hindgut, um, anastomosis here with the splenic vein. The splenic vein then goes on to join the superior mesenteric vein, which has drained the mid midgut. And these combine together to form the hepatic portal vein, which goes into the liver. So this is your liver here. And within your hepatic portal system, the venous blood goes into the liver and it goes into the sinusoids. And then it comes back out of the hepatic vein. From the hepatic vein, it then drains to the inferior vena cava here and returns to the heart, to the right atrium. That's everything for this video. So we've covered innovation and vasculature of the GI system. Um, a fairly dry subject, but obviously it'll take a bit of time. But sit down, try to learn all the branches and the innovation, um, and it will come together. Join us next time. We'll have a look at the pathway from the mouth to the anus of the GI tract, and also at some of the histology, which is absolutely essential to know um, for the exams.